Hi there. Today we're going to cover the end of World War I. Uh, the stuff that happens after World War I is pretty exciting. It's an interesting story to find out how World War II actually begins, but uh, we'll get to that another day. Uh, today uh, the story will, I think, also be pretty interesting. There's uh, some cool pictures um, and uh, stories, I think, uh, pretty exciting sometimes. So uh, let's get started. To set the stage for what's going to happen and where we left off, um, the war was not going well for the Allies in uh, early 1917. You'll remember the war ends in 1918, so the turnaround has to happen somehow. So why is Germany doing so well? Well, they've, they've managed to hold their own against Britain and France on the Western Front. And on the Eastern Front, uh, they've managed to take care of business pretty well. Uh, you know, Russia was one of the last countries in Europe to get the Industrial Revolution, so they're a bit behind. And they're so large that it would have taken them a long time to industrialize anyway. So they get stumped uh, by Germany. And uh, they surrender. New government uh, comes into Russia. So Russia is out of the war. And that means that Germany now only has to fight on one front, the Western Front. And this is how they would planned it for the most part. So it was up to the Allies to try and, uh, at least Britain and France, to try and get this all done on their own, essentially. In addition, uh, the Allies were not having much success. They were trying to attack in different places, uh, throwing more and more men at the problem. It never really seemed to get them anywhere. And to make things worse, Germany believed that it could get Britain out of the war by using its uh, growing navy, Germany's growing navy, to blockade Britain. Since Britain is an island, if you just surround it with ships or cut off its supplies, then uh, the uh, country of Britain would sort of slowly starve until uh, the government realized that it would need to surrender. So Germany thought it had a plan for the end of the war here. So how did this all get resolved? Well, we'll see. The other things to consider is that everybody at this point is pretty tired of war. Um, the predictions early in the war were that they'd all be home in a few months' time, and obviously that was nowhere near accurate. The war was way more gory, way more deadly, way more costly than anyone had imagined. This had been, by this point, uh, the world's deadliest war and still had over a year to go. So a lot of leaders were trying to find ways to end it, but at the same time they still had to keep up with the demands of continuing the war and somehow motivating people to fight the war, even though it was so awful. Um, one of the ways that they did this was with a draft. So you just draft people, you tell them you have to fight. Uh, but also, a lot of people were still encouraged to sign up uh, voluntarily. And this was done using a lot of propaganda. I'll show you some propaganda posters from this era. Some of them are pretty cool. Uh, some of them, I even think, uh, are funny. But um, I'll show them, see if you can figure out how they're trying to encourage people to enlist here. These are two from Britain. On the left... Uh, I'll start with the one on the right. This one looks a lot like uh, the Uncle Sam posters we've seen. Um, your country needs you. On the left, pretty straightforward as well. Uh, nothing too much to analyze here. It's telling you that it's honorable to sign up to fight for your country. Uh, you should be fighting for your country and for your king. It's your job to do this. Are you doing your job? God save the king. So, um, trying to provoke a sense of nationalism here. Uh, here's two more from Britain. I love the one on the left, but let's start with the one on the right first. Uh, that's John Bull in the center there. You can see some soldiers in the background. Who's absent? Is it you? In other words, you need to sign up. Everybody counts right now. On the left, we have a drawing of a, like a, a father with his two kids, his daughter's on his lap, and she's apparently reading some book about the Great War. You can see the kid below him is uh, playing games with toy soldiers. Um, so probably uh, there, this is a, the way I interpret this poster is that it's in the future. This is several years down the road. Uh, these kids are asking this guy, uh, Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? And here you can see he has this look of concern on his face I always read his look of concern, looking right towards the camera as, oh no, they've found me out. Or, what do I tell them when I didn't do anything? 
because I was scared of getting my head blown off. For some reason, I find it amusing. The father obviously is being guilted, or at least the, the viewer of this is being guilted into thinking, well, what will my kids think of me if I didn't sign up? So uh, may maybe they would have thought, uh, hey, I want to be around to have kids. You know, maybe, maybe that's what I would uh, tell these kids if I were that guy. You know what? I stayed home because I didn't want to die, and that's why you're here. It's my opinion. So I told you last uh, lecture that the reason that the Allies end up winning in the end is right there in front of you. The U.S. joins. So let's look at why we join. There are a lot of things that um, made us join. First of all, in the U.S., we had a lot of strong connections to Europe. At that time, in the early 1900s, the U.S. had tons and tons of immigrants from all over Europe, especially during this time, uh, immigrants from Russia, immigrants from uh, Poland, um, what, what was Poland, Italy, um, Central Europe. So tons of Americans had a connection to what was going on overseas. And, and certainly there were lots of people that felt like we shouldn't get involved, but also tons that thought we should. Um, I'll give you a fun example. In the U.S., of course, we were fighting against the Germans, and uh, German immigrants were one of the largest immigrant populations in the U.S., and uh, they were not very well looked upon by fellow Americans. Even Germans that had been here for many generations by this point in time were not fondly looked upon. And so, uh, in Chicago at least, uh, we used to have tons of streets that were named after Germans. Now we just have one. They were all basically erased during this time when uh, we were supposed to have all this anti, or did have all this anti-German sentiment. So the only German street, I'm sure some of you were curious, the only German street in Chicago is a street called Goethe Street. That's how you pronounce it. You may have seen it. It's on the near north side of downtown. G-O-E-T-H-E. -E. He's a famous German writer. Anyway, um, we'll have uh, all, this, all these feelings that will motivate us either to get involved or not get involved. Financially, we also had a connection. You can see I wrote here that the U.S. is sending tons of goods to its friends, France and Great Britain. We're selling lots and lots of stuff to them. So we don't just have an emotional connection. We have a financial connection. If France and Britain lose the war, we lose a huge customer and may not get our money back. So our wallets are strongly connected. We'll get even more reasons to join. Once Russia loses the war, we get a bit more worried that Germany would win, so we start to consider that maybe we should jump in to give the Allies a boost. And the country of Germany is going to start to do things that antagonize the United States. Namely, they start to attack U.S. ships that are going to and from Europe delivering supplies to our friends France and Britain. So if they're starting to sink ships of ours or sink ships that have Americans on board, uh, this is us directly suffering as a result of a conflict that we're not officially connected to, at least we're not officially involved in. We, didn't, we never declared war, at least prior to when we actually joined the war. So um, we'll sort of be goaded into joining by Germany in many ways. But, of course, they're just doing their job trying to win the war. There's no way you need to write down all this stuff up here about... Um, U.S. ships and all this stuff, this is all just fun details. As long as you've got this detail about Germany attacking U.S. ships, you're good. I think this is just a fun detail about uh, how it all unfolded. The most famous ship that was sunk by the Germans is a British ship, was a British ship, called the Lusitania. It was sunk in 1915, way before we joined the war in 1917. 128 Americans were on board and died. Germany sank it because even though this was like a passenger boat going back and forth between the U.S. and Europe, uh, Germany believed that the U.S. was sending weapons on this ship to Britain and France. Uh, the U.S. denied this, said, no, this was just a civilian ship. How dare you uh, kill civilians? And yet in the 1980s, I think it was, <clears throat> the ship was found. And what was discovered was that there actually were tons and tons of weapons on board. Uh, the um, analysis of the ship that was done was uh, pro proved, and they found tons of shells, but also a huge part of the hull was blown out uh, from a bomb, not a torpedo necessarily. There was stuff on board that exploded. So uh, was Germany right to sink the Lusitania? I don't know. I, I kind of say yes. 
you know, war is not pleasant. Certainly the U.S. was not interested in telling Germany that uh, they were going to get involved quite yet. So it's telling of how the U.S. felt about the war early on. We, we didn't necessarily want to get involved, but um, certainly were involved. Anyway, uh, not long after that sinking in May of 1915 in August, another ship is sunk. More Americans die. After Germany gets scared that we might join, they promise to stop sinking our ships. And then about six months later, they sink another ship and more Americans die. So they're either getting desperate or they're just hoping to close out the war. From then on, Germany says, uh, all right, look, um, starting in January of 1917, they're, they're going to sink all ships in British waters. They're looking to end the war, especially as Russia's on its way out. It's time to close the deal. So in response, our president, President Woodrow Wilson, says that if uh, Germany sinks another U.S. ship, we would declare war. And yet only three days later, despite that warning, uh, Germany sinks another U.S. ship. So the tension gets slowly ratcheted up over a couple years as more and more um, back and forth occurs, bluffing, lying, breaking deals. But the final straw that gets us involved is this thing called the Zimmerman Telegram. So if there's anything to write down on this slide, it would be this bullet point about the Zimmerman Telegram and the second bullet point under it. The Zimmerman Telegram is a telegram that was intercepted by Britain. It was supposed to be a secret telegram, a note sent from Germany to Mexico. And uh, the message of this telegram, I'll show you on the next slide uh, what it looked like, was uh, to try and get um, Mexico involved in the war, uh, wa Germany wanted to get Mexico to attack us. So even though we weren't officially in the war, Germany seemed to be doing a lot to bother us uh, and may have actually backfired. Who knows? Maybe they would have won the war if they weren't so mean to us, um, goading us to get involved. So here's what the Zimmerman telegram looked like. Look at all those coded things. Uh, the British intelligence uh, agency ends up intercepting this message. There's all this um, espionage going on. It's kind of exciting. So they intercept this message. They then have to decode it. And as I told you, they determine that this is suggesting an alliance between Germany and Mexico. And Germany tells Mexico, look, if you attack the U.S., we'll help you get some land back that you used to own in the southwest United States, like uh, New Mexico and California, and things like that. So once we um, are shown this message by our friends, the British, of course, the British show us this message because they want us to get involved and help them out. So we join in April of 1917. We've got our own propaganda posters. Um, see if you can figure out these two. The one on the left has one word in list. Obviously, they want you to sign up, but what's the picture? Why does this woman seem to have like a dress that's flying up and hair that's flying up? She's holding a baby. That's sad. What's going on here? Ah, I see. They're underwater. There's like bubbles. She's sinking. So what is this trying to get you to think about? Any idea? This is meaning to remind you of the Lusitania and all the other ships that Germans have sunk that caused American civilians to die. Sign up because people have already died for this war, civilians, innocent people. This one on the right is uh, way more entertaining. It's got all sorts of stuff to analyze here. So let's just start at the top. We'll go from the top to the bottom. Destroy this mad brute. You can see he's got a German helmet on. So this gorilla is meant to represent Germany. He's even got like a German mustache. I never noticed that until now. Uh, his hat, hat or helmet rather says militarism and uh, he's holding a woman this is a uh, old symbol of america her name's columbia she used to be on all sorts of coins and stuff she's basically the, the female representation of columbus which the united states has some connection with it's really stupid but uh so this is like america he's now grabbing us he's going to do things to us and uh, it says here in tiny text, if this war is not fought to a finish in Europe, it will be on the soil of the United States. And you can see here he's standing on a piece of land that says faintly America. And he's bringing his culture. He's going to destroy us. So there's a lot of fear about Germans 
um, not just the German country winning the war, but also German culture and destroying American culture, which is so stupid because a lot of American culture is German culture. But anyway, this is a typical fear of uh, immigrants that the United States has had over many decades that our lovely president is sowing once again among Americans. Immigrants are bad. Uh, no, they're not. We're all immigrants. Okay, so anyway. Um, these, of course, are encouraging U.S. people to sign up. Here's a couple more from the European side as the war goes on. Here's a German one on the left. This is Germany. And maybe you can guess what country this is supposed to represent. A lion is usually used to represent the country of Britain. It's all over their uh, royal shields and stuff like that. And here's the translations. translation. It is the last stroke to complete victory by war loans. I'll tell you more about war loans or bonds another day, but... Um, they're saying here, look, all you have to do to defeat the British is give the government some money. Wars are so expensive, they need so much money that at least uh, in World War I and especially in World War II, um, governments advertise to try and get people to give money to the government as a loan. Sometimes they're called a bond. Often they're just called a war bond. In World War I and World War II, sometimes they're called liberty bonds, uh, freedom bonds, freedom loans. And uh, this would uh, be repaid to you after the war was over. The idea was that you'd not only be helping your country to uh, win the war, you'd do your own part financially. If you couldn't uh, sign up, at least you could give some money. And uh, you'd even make money. You'd, you'd get more money back later once the country paid you back. Uh, so this poster here on the right, this is, I think, a U.S. poster. Uh, beat back the Hun. The Hun is an old term for the Germans. Uh, you might remember way back when the Germanic tribes overthrew the Romans. Uh, one of those tribes was the Huns. So this is an old reference uh, to Germans. People don't really call them the Hun anymore. It's kind of a, uh, I wouldn't say offensive term, but it's maybe now not appropriate. So uh, again, buy bonds. This person's clearly just killed somebody who's coming right after you. Bloodthirsty Germans. So what brings the end for Germany? The simple answer is that when the U.S. enters uh, the window closes so quickly for Germany because they know that we can bring so many millions and millions of troops. Uh, we were the largest country in the war by this point in terms of population. And uh, for Germany, think of a, a boxing match with 15 rounds. That's the longest a boxing match goes. We're in the 15th round here, basically. Germany's already been fighting for 14 rounds. They're exhausted. The U.S. is a fresh fighter. We're inexperienced, but we've got a lot of manpower behind us. All we need to do is swing uh, one or two big punches, and we'll be able to defeat Germany. Uh, you'll look at today a uh, World War I casualties worksheet. It'll show you all the casualties, wounded, killed, uh, for both sides, the Allied and the Central Powers. Some people have trouble analyzing this chart, so just take your time, look over all the chart. All the answers to the chart are or to the questions on the worksheet are on the chart. So it uh, shouldn't be hard for you as long as you can read the chart. But my point is this. Uh, one thing the worksheet is meant to point out to you is that the U.S. really doesn't provide that many troops in the, in the war compared to other European countries uh, that have been involved far longer. Makes sense. The U.S. joins a year and a half before the war ends. So even though we come in and we swing the final punch that knocks down Germany, uh, and we're like running around shouting how amazing we are, uh, the rest of Europe is, and, and most of the rest of the world sees that, you know, we didn't, we didn't really do a whole lot. We were pretty weak in many ways when we entered the war. We were just stronger than Germany that by that point was so weak from fighting its toughest war ever against multiple people and doing well, mind you. So um, at this time, once the U.S. joins, the Allies make some pretty quick advances. The Central Powers will start to surrender Germany, Austria, Hungary, mainly. Uh, the leader of Germ Germany will be forced to leave. And in its place, since you know when you overthrow a government, you've got to put something in instead, the Allies will um, force Germany to have a republic, a democratic republic. So instead of having a, a dictator, which is sort of like what they had before, they're now going to have to elect uh, their own governments. This hopefully will solve future problems. We know it doesn't. They end up with a dictator again anyway. This shouldn't surprise you. Of course, I'm talking about Hitler. This progression shouldn't surprise you. I told you that uh, revolutions are usually long and chaotic. Germany wasn't really in chaos once they got this new Republican government uh, or republic, but um, it shows you that it's not easy to make a government stick 
And it's not surprising to see them revert back to what they were used to before. Just like we saw in the French Revolution, you start with a king, you end with an emperor. And in between, there's a whole bunch of garbage. So Germany's going to be in a time of turmoil after World War I, economically, politically. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to get their feet under themselves. And uh, we'll talk more about why later another day. But all this makes it even more amazing, at least to me, that Germany still manages to become incredibly powerful again and almost win World War II. So all sorts of intrigue and drama we'll talk about in the years between World War I and World War II. Uh, the end of the war comes with a ceasefire signed November 11th, 1918. And eventually there will be a treaty signed to officially end the war in 1919. For the test, you need to know the war ends in 1918. So it's a four year war, 1914 to 1918, but officially the Treaty of Versailles ends the war in 1919. And in this treaty, uh, we've got a few pieces of information that will be important to us. So we'll go into more detail another day in the interwar years, but a uh, few other things to know, um, some related to the treaty, some not. First, the thing that's not related to the treaty, and then we're done with these notes. Uh, during World War I, there was a, a genocide. It's uh, kind of inappropriate to have it here as a footnote, a small note at the end of these uh, World War I things. One to two million people were killed. I mean, that's, uh, that's a lot of people. They're from the country of Armenia. Armenia is over here on the right, where you see the orange arrow pointing. This was right next to the Ottoman Empire. Turkey is born after World War I is over, but this used to be the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary. So the Ottoman Empire was trying to um, win some conflicts, and they thought the Armenians were a threat to them. So they were responsible for killing um, somewhere around one to two million. Uh, Turkish government officials today still kind of deny that this was genocide, that it was uh, targeted assassination of a specific group of people. Uh, they say it's just war. Why can't it be both? So um, the Armenian genocide is still a sore subject today among people in Armenia and uh, in Turkey. Um, and this is one of the many similarities between World War I and World War II. Both, of course, are going to have a genocide. There's tons of similarities between World War I and World War II. Uh, many of the countries on both sides are the same. The outcome is the same. The beginning is very similar. They both have a genocide. So um, look up some pictures if you want. Uh, the Armenian genocide, of course, is uh, pretty sad. Um, a lot of people were basically just left to starve out in the middle of nowhere. Um, some people were crucified. It's, it's not pleasant, uh, but um, you know it's important to expose ourselves to this stuff so it's not forgotten. Um, okay, so last things to know. Uh, World War I also involves the creation of uh, this uh, group of countries called the League of Nations. This was part of President Wilson's plan to end the war and prevent a future war. The League of Nations was the predecessor of the modern day United Nations. That's another similarity between World War I and World War II. Both of them will result in a, the creation of an international organization that would work to prevent future conflicts. Well, that worked out well, didn't it? Uh, the U.S. came up with this idea, and we did not join. It's like inviting people to a party and never showing up. The reason why we didn't join is because it was the president's idea, Woodrow Wilson's idea, and Congress did not agree to it. So that kind of explains it, but um, Congress did not want to join because we did not want to be, according to Congress, we did not want to be beholden to other countries. We, we wanted to remain more independent. So um, that was part of, uh, I wouldn't say the Treaty of Versailles, but part of our post-war agreements. So as you're thinking about all the things we went over today, uh, maybe you can see if you can answer this. I obviously won't collect this exit slip because uh, I'm not here, but see if you can answer this question. The U.S. was basically responsible for ending the war. What are the two main reasons we got involved in 1917? I think there's more than two, but see if you can decide what the main reasons are. You'll have a question like this on our test. Hope this is all very helpful, easy to understand, maybe even a tad entertaining. I'll see you all very soon. Bye. Thanks.